past couple of days and haven't been getting the secret word quiz up. <coughs> going. So I have uh, revealed the submission link for the Joust project here. With any luck, I guess I should go to student view and confirm that that is visible. So t Monday's a holiday, which I hadn't kind of incorporated into my thinking. So I currently have this thing due Thursday at midnight. <clears throat> that gives Wednesday for questions. I anticipate on Wednesday moving on ahead with new material, but I'll certainly be open to taking questions on Wednesday's class. Uh, and today is dedicated to talking more about the project. <clears throat> which should cover everything in here. Let's look at the rubric real quick. Program compiles. It runs correctly. Uh, you don't have some of this is easy points. Your generally your data is private. You got you have proper abstraction. Uh, to give you, a, you may be wondering where, how this, these kind of general rubric items apply. So I have here abstraction, proper data abstraction operations are grouped with data that is being manipulated. Occasionally, I'll get a project where, for instance, the classes, the knight and weapon classes, are really nothing but structures, data structures, where maybe they have all the data in it, but then they don't have any functions that do anything. They just have like get name, get type, get hit chance, get stamina required, get stamina, set stamina. And what they'll do is in main, when it's time to figure out whether or not a weapon hits, they'll directly ask the weapon to get the hit chance. And then inside of main, they'll they'll create a random number object and get a random number and do the comparison there. And if, uh, you know, depending on what that rolls, de deciding whether or not the weapon hits, that is an example of improper <laughs> abstraction. It goes against everything we've been doing this past week uh, for, for this project. So for people who don't come to class and don't, well, I don't know. I don't know what's going on in their heads, but they're out there. That, that, that's for that special person right there. Uh, we okay, so what do we have here? Weapon attributes, weapon as type, hit probability, stamina required. We should have that. Knight attributes, name, whether they're on a horse, stamina, a knight. Uh, this relationship, I'm asking, be made that knight has a weapon. So this was covered very quickly at the end, and I'll be going into more detail with this. But this as I mentioned right at the tail end there, it does have a special connotation in object-oriented programming generally and certainly in C++ where a knight has a weapon. The analogy you can draw is with the knight's name. The knight has a name and, and if you recall I've said it a few times that the string type is actually a class. Someone wrote a string class. They have class string. They have a public area, a private area in a whole bunch of member functions. So that what you're doing it, without realizing it, you say string name, you're actually creating a string object 
as part of the knight class. And I'm asking you to do the same thing with the weapon class. Create a weapon object as part of the knight as well. And I would have phrased it weapon in hand, I believe, from last time. Knight has a single constructor, which takes five arguments. This is where I'm going to be focusing a lot of today's discussion. Weapon has a single constructor, which takes three arguments. Uh, weapon and knight constructors have initialization lists. I have not talked about that. That's what we're doing today. Uh, here I'm trying to ensure that you're... So I had talked about how this... I use this as an example for where you get debates as to where to put functionality. Uh, we decided, or perhaps I decided, and I'm ramming down your throats, uh, the idea that the behavior of getting a random number and comparing it to the weapon's hit chance belongs in a member function of weapon rather than main generating the random number and asking the weapon for the hit chance and doing the comparison in, in one of Knight's functions. Okay, So uh, that's just enforcing that with the rubric. Uh, and user input, user specifies value for weapon in Knight and main. You should need five pieces of information for each weapon Knight combination. You need the Knight's name and stamina. You need the weapon's type, hit chance, and stamina required. There's an additional piece of data that I, I'm not listing in that five. What is that additional piece of data that I'm not listing that the knight has? Is it horse on horse? On horse, right? On horse boolean. Why is it that I'm not asking for that information from the user? You just assume they're on the horse. Yeah, hey, it's not. If you're gonna ask it for the user and they say, "Well, this time around, let's have them not on the horse and see what happens," that <laughs> then the game doesn't even play, right? So don't ask for that information. You should be hard coding in there. You, I want to see the word "true" in there, making sure that on horse variable is hard coded to true whenever you create a knight, All right? Um. All right, so the user provides those values. I don't want to forget to talk about this. Hopefully, if I, if I get 10 minutes and I haven't talked about the user specifying values, uh, there's something I want to say about that, so remind me if I don't talk about that early on. Knights joust until one is unhorsed or collapses due to exhaustion, so making sure you have your while loop set up there. Um, I haven't talked about this a lot, but the weapon class should have a display function and the display function should say type. In fact, uh, I want to talk about. Let me. I'll provide some information on that on what uh, should be displayed. So both the knight and the weapon have a display function. And note that weapon's display function is actually called from knight's display function. Okay. So that's a key piece of information there. Uh, the state of the knight, and, and this is also key, the state of the knight, whether the knight is on the horse and whether they're collapsed, is stored by the knight, not by any other code. Where people lose points on this over and over again is what happens is, uh, let's go back to the role play that we had here at the front of the room. Main turned to one knight and said, wield, and then a true or a false came back to main, right? And then what was the very next thing that main did? Uh, if it was, assuming it was true. Unhorse yourself. To the other knight. Right. So <laughs> what, if true came back, then main turns to the other knight and immediately says unhorse yourself. That is proper behavior. Where that behavior is not proper is if main says wield and then gets back a true, and then main tucks that in a little variable under this arm, and then uh, says to this knight, wield, and this comes back with true or false, and main holds that piece of information in, under the other arm, and then when it gets to the top of the loop, main's looking at these two variables, he's got tucked under his arms, rather than asking the knight, are you on your horse, are you exhausted, are you on your horse, are you exhausted, you see the difference there? In that case, main is maintaining the state keeping track of the state of each knight, and Maine has no business doing that, right? 
If you want to find out if a knight is exhausted, ask the knight whether the knight is exhausted. Do not ask the knight for their stamina and then keep track of that information and look at it a little bit later and compare it to zero. Or don't ask the knight if they're on the... Uh, don't find out that a wheel unhorses the other horse, excuse me, unhorses the other knight, and then main keeps track of that information instead of turning to the other knight and saying unhorse yourself. All right? Any questions on that? Does that make sense? All right. Uh, so a couple things here I want to talk about very quickly. <clears throat> the display. Yes, I don't need to put the word night there. <coughs> Alright, whatever. So this is the kind of output I want to see at the end of each round. What the output should look like at the end of each round. Okay. And the way if the way that should look is something like this. Inside of main in your loop, that's how I get that information to print out. So you've written a display function for the knight class and the knight is going to examine the stamina if it's less than or equal to zero it's going to say is exhausted otherwise if it's greater than zero it's going to put the word not in here is not exhausted and then you're going to check the value of that boolean and say whether the knight is on the horse or has been unhorsed and then there will be a line of code so if I'm to look at And this is in night in come on in night's display function. Oops. There's gonna be right, you're asking the weapon in hand to display itself. So here, you, we're at the dot, dot, dot down here at the bottom. That's where you're figuring out um, the, this information. And then after the dot, 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 you have weapon in hand dot, dis then you have weapon, then you have weapon in hand dot display. And weapons display function is going to display those three pieces of information. Okay. Questions? Right. So let me talk a little bit now about constructors. And I'm going to use a totally different example. Um, 
Uh, let me make it time a little bit shorter. Oops. Come on. I will talk about what I'm doing here in just a minute. Excuse me. That wasn't me, really. Excuse me again. All right, so I've got a class here that I'm calling time, which is got an hour and a minute. I'm going to create a public function. Uh, I'm going to create a constructor, and it's going to take an hour, and it's going to take a minute. And now I'm going to write that function. It'll be modified here after a while, but I want to start out doing it the way that we know and love, which is the times hour variable I want to set to whatever's in H, and times minute variable I want to set to whatever's in M. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and test that now. So I'm going to say time t And this is just for me doing the good habit of testing things after I write a little bit of code so I can get rid of any bugs as I write. Looks like that's bug free, so I'm going to keep going. Oh, I'll go ahead and create a, a time display function. And I'll just do Oops, I don't have that right, do I? Hang on, got to make some changes here. I should test that. So I'll say t dot display. Mm -hmm. I need IO manip, yeah. I need to declare it. Void display. There it is. Okay, so far so good. Now, I need to write a constructor for a historical event. And in order for me to create a historical event, I need a string representing the description of the event, and I need the hour and the minute in which that event happened. So let me start writing the code for that. Um, actually, I'm gonna. I want to talk a little bit more about time here before I get into this. So I'm just gonna comment this out for the moment. All right. <clears throat> what we did with our our web counter class when we wanted to create a web counter, we would say web counter wc. So if I was to do the same thing with time. I would do something like time t. Yeah, does everyone understand the consistency there? Okay, but let me try, let me get rid of the web counter 
code now. Let me try actually doing this here on line 43. And what we find is that it no longer compiles. So there it is complaining about line 43. It is complaining about this line. This is code that was working as far as what we know up to last week and now suddenly this code isn't working. And its, and it's complaint is that there's no matching constructor for the initialization of time. And it's saying that there is uh, this constructor here. Here's a candidate constructor. Uh, we can't use this one. This one's not viable because it requires two arguments, but you gave me a version that has no arguments. And this is, so it's saying this is um, the one, my one possibility. So what's up with that? Let me try let me try doing something funky here for a minute. Let me actually comment out this constructor. And then I, I have to comment out this code here for this constructor. So let me get rid of this constructor altogether. Now it works absolutely fine. So this is weird, right? If I don't declare any constructor at all, a line of code like that works fine. As soon as I create a constructor, in this case a constructor that takes two integers, then line 43 no longer works. And what's happening is that uh, there are, for every class you create, it turns out that there are some functions that, are, that the compiler writes for you if you don't provide them yourself. And the one that's relevant to us here is something called the default constructor. I don't know. Have I defined that? I think I've defined default, right? What is a default constructor? Does anyone recall the definition of that? Uh, the automated, yeah, it has more of a, a specific, in this case, it ha, it's a specific kind of constructor. It is a constructor that takes no arguments. Now, I could write one if I wanted to. If I was to write a default constructor, it would look something like this. I would say time, and it takes no arguments, and I would say this is a default constructor. Okay, and I could, I could go ahead and write the source code for it. Time doesn't take any arguments. And maybe when I do that, maybe what I want to do is I want to say that the hour is equal to 12 and that the minute is equal to 0. Uh, so I can certainly write a default constructor. And you see that it compiles just fine. And in fact, I can put a little statement in here. I can say I am in default constructor. And I compile this, and when I run it, it says that I am in default constructor. It set those. It set it to 12 o'clock, and so it was on line 49 where it actually ran that default constructor. So the first thing to know is if you never write a constructor yourself for a class, a default constructor will be written for you. Now that default constructor that's written for you looks something like this. Right, nothing to it basically. So it's not a really useful thing that it does, but it, it does. It, it's going under the axiom of consistency in that you are not allowed to create a class without running a constructor. And by golly, if you do not write any constructor, I'm going to provide one to you. And that, that's kind of the line of thinking there. There's some historical reasons, but it's it's beyond the scope of this class to talk about that. Um, but something interesting happens, which is. Let me get rid of my default constructor now. So now the compiler is creating a default constructor for me. As soon as I write my own constructor, regardless of the type of constructor I write, as soon as I write my own constructor, then all bets are off and the compiler will no longer provide any constructor to you. So that's what is happening when this line here doesn't compile uh, on line 42 now. Because I have now written my own constructor, so the default constructor is no longer written for me. And if I want a de default constructor, I have to write it myself. Okay? So that's one thing to make note of. <clears throat> so let's now go to my report class. Now that we have that is something that's playing around in the back of our heads. Let's ignore, let's ignore line 29, and, and let me focus on line 28 for a moment. So here's private data. Now, this is not a trick question, so just give me your intuition. Your intuition will be correct. Uh, 
Is there anything wrong with the line of code on line 36? Should 36 work correctly? It's not a trick question. Yeah. yeah, it should work fine, and it does work fine, okay? But I can make an observation about line 36, is that I am guaranteed that description actually exists. Now, that may seem weird for me to point that out, um, but look at that in this context. It, the same thing follows here. There's nothing wrong with lines 17 and 18. That means that the hour private data of time and the minute private data of time have to exist on lines 17 and 18 for them to work, right? Okay. Or to put it another way, as soon as I hit that open curly brace, all of my private data has to exist. Everyone, everyone accept that? So that means that all of that information is brought into existence just prior to me hitting the first line of code in my constructor. Okay? And that is, that's the key. All of that data has to be brought into existence just prior to that open curly brace. So now let's look right here. What that means, what private data and historical event has to be brought into existence just prior to the open curly brace on line 35? The description, which we got, and the variable named when, which is a time. Time has to be brought into existence prior to that open curly brace on line 35. And that is when I create a historical event. So I do something like historical event uh, doodling during the boring parts of the Constitutional Convention. No, no, no. Uh, you don't see that in the history books much, but it actually did happen, I'm sure. Convention. And that happened, I think it was at 12.03 that afternoon. Oops, 12.03. All right. So here, I, oh, that isn't quite right. I need to give this variable a name. We'll call it HE. All right. So I'm going to create the HE variable on line 43, which we know is going to run a constructor. It's going to run a constructor that takes three arguments, a string and two integers. Do I have such a constructor for a historical event that takes a string and two integers? Yes, right here. Okay. That means that the, all the private data of a historical event has to be brought into existence prior to the open curly brace on line 35. That includes a description and when. How is when created? What kind? What has to happen for when to be created? Well, it, what what code runs when when? <laughs> bad choice of <laughs> variable names. When the when? How can I say this without saying when? Should the variable when on line 29 be created, what code gets run? The constructor. <laughs> the constructor for time, yes? What is my constructor for time? Do I have a default constructor that will create a time without any information? No, because the compiler is no longer writing a default constructor for me. In fact, this code won't even compile because it's going to say, I have no way of creating when here just before line 35. So let's actually, uh, I'm going to get rid of that. I'll, I'll leave this time there for old time's sake, something for us to reminisce about in later years. Um, this line here should not compile because it doesn't have any idea of how to create when because it's a time and it can only be created with Constructor for historical event must explicitly initialize the member when, which does not have a default constructor. Because we wrote our own constructor, so no default constructor is written for us. Saying here's the constructor. Note, if we were to look up in the private data of a uh, historical event, here's where that piece of private data is created. And oh, by the way, here's where you created time. So it's given us uh, some useful information for us to go back and scratch our heads over it. So we need a new mechanism in the language for us to create when using two arguments. And they introduce a whole new set of syntax. 
So it has to happen before the open curly brace. So what they do is they say, uh, again, the language is very flexible with spacing. I'm putting it on a different line. You could start right here after this closed parenthesis, is you put a colon. Now you name the variable that you want to initialize. Listen to that phrase. Now you list the name of the variable you want to initialize. What is the name of the variable I want to initialize? When. when. Not time. When. Because why would it be, why is it wrong to put time there? Because what if I do this? Yeah? Okay, which time is it talking about? Is it talking about the one on 29, 30, or 31? Yeah, the, the type doesn't matter. It's the name of the variable. Yes? What is the hour that I want to initialize when with? So these two variables here, you can then plug in as arguments to this two parameter constructor for time. Now this should work. And it does, and I can run it. Uh, I don't display. I don't have a display for the historical event, so that's why we're not seeing anything for that. <clears throat> because so we now have a, a reason why we're required to have initialization lists. Since we're but we're not required to have it for description. Um, why not? Why does description the string class? Why does the string class not vomit all over the place when we try to compile it? It has a default constructor. Now, since we have to put use the initialization list for some of our variables, it is considered good C++ practice to use the initialization list for all of our variables if possible. Okay, So that means I should use it for description. And what information does description take? Yeah, there's actually a one argument constructor that'll take a string. Now my, so what you're seeing on lines 34 through 37 is actually not completely unusual in the language where you end up having all of the work that needs to be done just in that initialization list and you end up having empty brackets there on lines 36 and 37. All right, so why am I going to the trouble to do this for you? If we go back to our rubric, weapon has only a single constructor, and that constructor takes three arguments. Remember, your weapon is private data of the knight class, right? Which means the only way you're going to be able to initialize weapon in hand is by providing it three pieces of information in knight's initialization list. Uh, also, I want you to get away from, although this is the most common thing to do, you have a variable in the parameter list that ends up being an argument to, uh, these to this initialization list. No, oh, excuse me, there's no semicolon here. So this is the initialization list, the syntax is a colon, and then a list of variables separated by a comma. Uh, very flexible what you can do with an initialization list. So let me give... Um, let me give a float, I don't know, for whatever reason I have a float called pi in historical event. Uh, you can put hard-coded numbers in here. So I don't have to do something like this. I don't have to say float p and then say pi where I pass in the parameter p. That's certainly fine, but uh, what's also fine is for me to do this. I can just hard-code a number in there. Can anyone think of any data in the knight class that it just needs to be hard-coded every time you create a knight? On horse. on horse. So you put one of your things in the initialization list will be on horse, and in parentheses there you'll just have the word true to make on horse 100% 100 of the time initialized to true. Will you hard-code their uh, beginning stamina too? Uh, stamina will not be hard-coded, so you will be... Uh, asking the user for the stamina, and so you will have an integer for the stamina, and that will then, so then you'd have stamina 
in some variable like s or whatever you call it, right? Since the user will enter that. The one piece of information that the user does not enter is the on horse variable. That you can just hard code to true, just as I've hard coded pi to 3.14. When you say user entering it, you're, you're not talking about uh, you know, running it. Uh, you, you're talking about entering it from main, right? When you, when you create yes, the, 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 the user would enter the information from main. And so let me, uh, I, I wanted to talk a bit about that, so let me talk about that now. Uh, to mimic kind of what we have to do, let me make sure my code's compiling here. Okay. Uh, what I might do is say see out. What is the event? What is the description? Event? Yeah, that's fine. Event description. And I'm going to create a string D. And I'll say CND. And then I'll say C out. What hour did it occur? What minute did it occur? And then this becomes, I'm initializing it with the D, H, and M variables that I've done up here. Okay, so this is the kind of thing you're going to do. You're going to ask the user for five pieces of information. What is the knight's name? What is the knight's stamina? What is the type of weapon? What is the weapon's hit chance? What is the weapon stamina required? After you ask those five questions, where I've asked three, then you're going to say something like knight k1, and you're going to be passing in those five pieces of information. Three of them will go to weapon and hands constructor in the initialization list. The knight's name will go into the knight's name in the initialization list. The knight's stamina will go to the knight's stamina in the initialization list. And then on horse will be in the initialization list with true hard-coded. You'll do this exact same thing for the other knight. You'll ask five more questions and initialize the other knight. Okay? And you can reuse these variables, right? If I, was to, if I had to create two historical events, uh, what I would do is I'd copy and paste this stuff here. And then I wouldn't, I would just delete where I've created these variables, right? I can reuse D, H, and M, and then I can create a second historical event. Yeah, so you do this, you'll do the same kind of thing for night. Uh, so here's, here's where I want to give you uh, something that'll speed things up. What's a real drag about this project? is when you start coding it up and now you need to test it, right? And you run this thing like a thousand times trying to get it right and testing it. What is the event description? Did stuff. And I'll just say stuff. When hour did it occur? 5.23. And now I've got the other event. Um, things that occurred at 6.14. Okay, so now I need to go test it. You see how it wastes a lot of time for me to type that information in? What you should do is figure out what you're going to type in and create a file. Call it whatever you want. I'm going to call it uh, joustinput.txt. And uh, stuff, all the things you'd answer. Uh, the hour was 5.23. Things occurred at six nineteen. That's my. Those were the. That's what I entered with the keyboard. I hit stuff. Hit return. I entered five. Hit return twenty three. Right. Everyone got that. Now when I run this thing, I type in the name of my executable. I have the. I have a, a less than symbol like this, and what this is doing is this is saying, rather than taking the input from the keyboard, take the input from this file as if that is what is being typed in from the keyboard. Now when I do that, I just hit return. It, the spacing looks a little bit weird, and what you're not seeing is you're not seeing the keystrokes echoed out, because they're not being echoed out, right? It's coming from the file. But all of this information 
uh, is being entered. <clears throat> so I would use, I would create an input file for your 10 pieces of uh, information for the two knights and their weapons. And then as, you're, as you are uh, testing your project, I would do it this way. That's going to save you a huge amount of time so you don't have to enter 10 pieces of information over and over and over again. All right? Questions? Uh, question on the make file. Yes. Since um, since uh, only random is inside a weapon and weapon is inside of knights and so on and so forth, do you still put um, <coughs> you're, you're still compiling all the the .o files together inside of yeah, the, the make the make file has to have all the o, .o files, including random .o. So you need to include a, a comp, uh, make rule for random as well. Okay. It's exactly the same as the others, right? Yeah. You're going to make random .o, that's from random.cpp and random.h, and it's g++ minus c, that thing. Yeah. All right. Um, let me talk a couple minutes about... Oops. No. Third time's a charm. There we go. What does anyone can anyone form a question they'd like to ask uh, in terms of how to convert this to code? Yes. Else return false, yes. Should that be the way? Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. This is incorrect. Good, good spot. So it should say if stamina is greater than zero, return false, else return true. Yes, I did get it backward there. Or, or you can say, are you not exhausted? And uh, <laughs> Pick your poison, right? As long as it works. As long as the function matches. Yes, as long as what it's returned matches the question being asked. Uh, let me talk a moment about random. So there's, uh, how much time do I have? I'll mention it briefly anyway. So th there's a question as to what should be private data and what does not need to be private data. And the general t programming phrasing I would use is, if that variable needs to maintain state across member function calls, then it should be private data. What do I mean by that? A couple functions of um, the knight are uh, wield and are you exhausted? Yes? Does the state, do you need to keep track of the stamina? between those two function calls. I ask a knight to wield, I ask a knight to wield, I ask the knight, are you exhausted? Do, does the knight need to keep track of that stamina between those calls? Yeah. Well, if, let's say you don't. I ask you to wield, right? And then I ask if you're exhausted. What are you going to look at to tell me if you're exhausted? You have to, but it has to be based on what value it had when I asked you to wield because you reduced that stamina. So you need to remember that stamina across different function calls. All right. That is the key way of knowing that it becomes private data. Interesting thing about this random. So in um, uh, that would be inside of weapons did you hit function, which I, I had in a later diagram. It's the question mark on this one. So recall that when uh, the knight turned to the weapon and said, did you hit? The weapon turned to me and said, get, and I gave that weapon a random number. Me is a random. You do not need to keep track of anything, right? So I ask weapon, did you hit? And then a few iterations later, I ask weapon again, did you hit? I, there's nothing about me that needed to maintain state between those two calls. There's nothing about me being saved, right? That means that it's not necessary to make me, in fact, preferred not to make me a private data of weapon because you don't need to keep track of me between function calls. 
Well, where do I come from? Just create me as a local variable. You all have created local variables. Uh, weapon dot cpp weapon colon colon did you hit uh, that's going to return a bool random r between one and there's a local variable yes every time I call this function I'm going to recreate r so that's how that's where you should be putting the random is just as a local variable and then when you need it at the right point, you can say r.get. Okay. Uh, so, a uh, couple things. One, I, I need to give you the secret word. I'll give that to you in just a second. Uh, second, there uh, posted in Piazza, some folks were going to get on the fourth floor of the library later today to work on this. I would strongly recommend you do that. Uh, Rumor has it, I think that everyone's going to rewatch the role playing video, and whenever someone says wield, you have to take a shot. Um, <laughs> hopefully, there's a little more than that to it. Um, yeah, definitely recommend you do that. Uh, and I'm not, I don't want to, I meant to do this as a totally separate conversation days ago. I don't want to connect it to people getting to the library and getting together because that's not the motivation for me saying this now. Up to this point in the semester, um, I it's hard for me to detect people who are copying off one another because the programs are so simple. Now we're getting to bigger projects and you really, it's in the syllabus, you have to do your own work. Okay? There's an automated tool that all this code gets dumped to and what it does is it finds similarities. It does an all pairs comparison. Your code is going to be compared to every other student's code in this class and from previous semesters as well. And wherever there are high matches, it shows where the code matches. Okay, and when you change variable names and stuff like that, it doesn't change the output of this. When you all, and, and so again, I'm not saying this in the context of the library because that's absolutely what you need to do. But there's a big difference between you all getting into the library and saying, well, how are you doing that? And even looking at what they have for code and let's try this together and so forth. That's different from, i got to turn this in tomorrow. Give me your code. I'll change the variable names. All right? You see the difference? So I'm just warning you, do not give your code to someone else to copy off of because it gets both of you an F in the course. All right? Work together. Share information. Look at how other people are doing things. But when you sit down and type it, make sure it's your own typing happening. All right? So that, that's all I wanted to say about that. And I definitely encourage you to do this library thing at uh, whatever time of day it was supposed to be. I think that's a fantastic thing to be doing. Three or four. I was the one who was today. Three or four. We'll be around. Three o'clock. Was it three o'clock? Yeah. All right. So my, if I was saying four, my apologies. Yeah, three o'clock. So uh, definitely, uh, I, I recommend you do that. Uh, also, Piazza. Feel free to use Piazza. Try to avoid doing the private. Me I get a lot of private messages on Piazza, which is fine. I, I would prefer that you all make them public messages. If you want to make them anonymous, that's fine. I love the public messages because then everyone gets to benefit from seeing what the question is. And I would encourage you to make use of that as well. Even as a group at four, if you have a question for me, I'll, I'll try and answer it. Uh, if we have a question that's not about coding or error that we're getting, should we still use Piazza? I think Piazza is great for anything. Even like, oh, I was kind of messing around with Linux and I'm wondering how you do blah, blah, blah. I mean, anything is fine on Piazza. Absolutely. All right. So, ha oh, I didn't give you the word yet, right? The magic word is. Yeah, let me do this. Uh, came across this word today, actually. I did not know this word prior to this morning. Irredentist. A person advocating the restoration to their country to any territory formerly belonging to it. It is used in the context of a story about Putin, uh, his irredentist uh, pursuit of the Crimea. It's not a politics class. I'm not making a statement politically. It's an interesting word. And it's got a fantastically specific meaning. I mean, who comes up with this stuff? We shouldn't have to speak in full sentences. They should have like a single word for every sentence we'd ever say. All right. Have a good one. Have a fantastic three-day weekend.